in chemistry. First of all, I'd like to invite Professor Amarelli to direct the Faculty of Science to the University to give a report on our Faculty of Science because it's very, very special edition. Professor Amarelli, please. Uh, important uh, 
in Thailand at the moment, we haven't seen so much uh, conflict and violence in our own country uh, than in the last 11 months. Mexican University is devoted to conflict resolution. We have several degree programs uh, to serve as uh, underpinning studies to achieve peace. Uh, 32 years ago, we launched the first environment management master degree program at Michigan University. And now there is contributing to more equitable allocation of natural resources and the avoidance of squabbles and uh, conflicts arising from unequal or uh, use of the natural resources uh, or fighting over natural resources. A second uh, degree program which was launched 20 some years ago was a, a comparative religious studies program which has now grown into a college of religious studies. A third program is rather new, a program on uh, human rights in collaboration with the uh, Raoul Endenberg Institute in uh, Lund in uh, uh, Sweden and the University for Peace uh, based in Costa Rica. Uh, these programs uh, have served us uh, quite well uh, so far. But we were quite surprised in the last 11 months with the conflict arising in the South. Therefore, Mahidon University together with the National Security Council and other organizations, other universities, including Songkran Korean University, uh, Paxin University in Songkran, and uh, Thomasa University and Jilangpa Universities uh, form a alliance and we have been down to the south already. The, the purpose is not to find faults with anyone. The purpose is to understand everyone a little bit better. Since His Majesty the King already gave us uh, uh, instruction that the way to solve problems anywhere is to understand each other well and to get close to one another and uh, to develop the, the region. So this is what we are trying to do. So the topic of uh, Professor Lee's uh, lecture is particularly uh, suitable here at Mexico University. And on this uh, occasion, I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Uwe uh, Morovich of the International uh, Foundation for Peace at the Sikon Bank uh, for their support for this uh, series of lectures. Now, I, I don't think I need to say anything about Professor Lee because he is already very well known and uh, I'm very happy to welcome him back to Thailand again. He has been to Thailand many times. Uh, last October, as president of the Academia Sinica, he represented uh, Taiwan in the APEC leading, uh, meeting of leaders. And uh, I, I asked him, and this, this time is his fifth trip to Bangkok. And I only hope that uh, he hope women, uh, the Thai work and Taiwan, the one to Chin Chi Yitian, Chai Di Pu, Jing Di Pu. So in the new, near future, the relationship, academic relationship between uh, Thailand and Taiwan uh, can be moved one step further. So with that, I declare this lecture open. Thank you very much.
tolerance, curiosity, attentiveness, and humor are some of the basic qualities of the Thai way. These are also basic principles for dialogue. Dialogue is the first step towards peace. Increasing ethnic, political, religious, and social conflicts and the helplessness to respond to them without further stimulating the spiral of violence show us daily, peace is not given. It has to be constantly learned, created, and experienced anew. Peace is not a passive state. Peace is a process which needs time and the participation of everyone. Above all, peace begins with education. The seeds of peace need to be planted in schools and universities in the new generation. This is why the International Peace Foundation cooperates with 76 institutions, including 23 schools and universities nationwide, as well as with the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Education Society of Thailand, the Science Society of Thailand, and UNESCO, among others. It emphasizes the importance of Thailand's education and scientific community, which interacts with 28 Nobel laureates of peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and economics, who have been and will be visiting Thailand as keynote speakers in the Bridges event series. The International Peace Foundation, with its base in Vienna, has not opened a branch or established another Thai foundation, but facilitates and hosts the 250 events between November 2003 and April 2005 with Thai partners. In doing so, the foundation acts as an independent pool, offering its network of organizations, Nobel laureates, and artists to support peace and education projects of existing Thai institutions with contacts and knowledge. ได้ให้คําสัญญาว่าจะกลับมาประเทศไทยเป็นประจําเพื่อร่วมวิจัยและดําเนินโครงการร่วมศึกษาปานกลางๆในประเทศไทยรวมทั้งเชื่อมความส
is future to be is to be by. So that is a very interesting uh, uh, history. Uh, and during that time, I think I come across one paragraph in this book philosophy that the reason that he wants to be a scientist because he was reading autobiography of Mary Curie. And, and this is something that a, a reading of, of some documentation really turned once into a, to a career scientist. And, and mind you, this is probably one of the best career scientists. So uh, I don't know whether it's too late for the audience to go back and read Mary Curie's and B.A. Curie's or not. But, but perhaps you could give that to your grandchildren. <laughs> Maybe they will become scientists. Uh, after that, um, after I decided to become a scientist, uh, Professor Lee uh, go on to National Taiwan University uh, in 1955 to get his master's degree. Maybe this is another reason that after receiving his Nobel Prize, after receiving Professor Sim at UC Berkeley, he come back to the National U Taiwan University because Taiwan University accept him as a, he doesn't have to pass any exam. He, he, he was accepted as a base student. So at that time, Taiwan University already had a system to select the best and the brightest and, and give them whatever they want, and pass it through every, every guidelines, every, every restriction that they have. I don't know whether this is the reason that he is now a Rentas professor at National uh, Taiwan University. Perhaps maybe Thai University should copy that, get the best and the brightest and, and admit them without going through the entrance exam and hoping uh, 50 or 60 years after that they will win the Nobel Prize and come back to Taiwan University. But I think that was a good move by National Taiwan University uh, to accept them as uh, students without going through the exam. Uh, after that, he went through this uh, graduate school and then go to the University of California at Berkeley to do his uh, doctoral degree, uh, and then go on to uh, do a postdoctoral at uh, Howard University, and then uh, come back uh, in 1974. Before that, uh, postdoctoral at the University of Chicago, and then come back to be a full professorship at the uh, University of Berkeley, uh, California, University of California at Berkeley. Um, after that, uh, 10 years ago, he decided to come back to Taiwan, and now he created and become uh, president of the Academy of Seneca, as well as I said before, uh, America's professor in chemistry at National Taiwan University. I was asking him at lunch, uh, he's still running laboratory, he's still spending half day of the week uh, discussing research with students. Uh, he doesn't become president of, of Academia Seneca and do everything politically maneuver, uh, but still have laboratory and and uh, still keep active research life. I think he has achieved tremendously during the 10 years he was from uh, at Taiwan. He said that he he be able to raise research funding uh, every year by 10%. And now research funding, R&D funding in Taiwan is over 2%, 2.3% uh, of, uh, of the growth uh, the domestic uh, TNP product. Uh, I'm not telling you how much Thailand is having at this moment. Uh, it will give you some, some point. 516 uh, presidency. I was going to say 523, but he said 516, okay. Uh, so I think he has achieved a great deal in the in, in, in direction of, of research policies and um, still keeping his lab. I think that's very important. Uh, I think uh, I have said enough, and it's now time that we would like to welcome Professor Yuan T. Lee. Uh, to give us a, a lecture on science, technology, and peace on earth. I'm sure that we will learn a lot from this lecture and a lot to take home with. Welcome, Professor Lee.
Professor Pon Chai, President of Hawaii Law University, Professor Amore, Dean of Faculty of Science, Mr. Ube Morabetz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and great honor to be able to spend this afternoon with you. I certainly want to thank the Peace Foundation as well as University of Mahido for having me here. Well, it was true that uh, I married my elementary school classmate. But I didn't marry when I was in elementary school. <laughs> when I was in elementary school, there was a girl student who always did better than I. I was always ranked second in the entire school. And there's a lady, she always went first in every aspect. So I married her later on. <laughs> that's very simple, but I think that's the best decision I made in my life. Maybe the worst decision made by, by, by my wife. <laughs> because um, as a scientist, who spent day and night in, in the laboratory, she hardly saw me at home. Except that when I tried to fix things for her. But today, uh, I will be talking about science, technology, and peace on Earth. I will start by telling you the changing world and causes of conflict at the present time. For thousands of years, the planet Earth seemed to be infinitely large, and reaching its end seemed to be an impossible task. The Earth was so immense and had such limited population that the impact of human activities on the biosphere seemed quite negligible. But since the Industrial Revolution, however, and particularly during the 20th century, the situation has changed dramatically. In this century, the world population has increased from 1.5 billion to 6 billion, and with the advancement of communication technology and transportation equipment. In relative terms, the Earth has shrunk. Even though the sudden transition from unlimited space to limited space has significant consequences, human society seems to be ill-equipped to adapt to the new limited reality. On this limited earth, with so many people pursuing unlimited material comforts, perhaps the most important challenge for scientists is negotiating energy use with its impact on a living environment. It was only 30 years ago, with the 1972 UN Conference on the Human Environment, that the view of environmental impact and technological changes and population growth began to attract serious concern. As the world is becoming smaller and smaller, challenges for each country to combat the deteriorating living environment have become global problems and must be seen as challenges faced by all of humankind. Holes in the ozone layer, the global warming trend, and the reduction of sunshine by 15% in Southeast Asia during the last several decades due to the rampant pollution are such examples. Examine in this entirety from an environmental perspective, we find that in many ways the world is overdeveloped. With the unseen generation of carbon dioxide by human activities and the consequent worsening of 
global warming trends, the common practice of categorizing countries as developed, developing, and underdeveloped has become increasingly un unrealistic. From an environmental point of view, even the so-called developed and developing countries are often not sustainable and should also be categorized as overdeveloped. Unfortunately, even developing country has been attempting to closely follow the developmental model outlined by the so-called developed countries, particularly in their obsession with improving material comforts and increasing per capita income. When I arrived at Berkeley, California as a graduate student in 1962, Taiwan was extremely poor. The first day on campus, I was shocked to see people after washing their hands in the restroom, using paper towels to dry their hands, then throwing the towels away. Today, the so-called civilized part of Southeast Asia seem to be mimicking this same wasteful process. In 1994, 10 years ago, when I went back to Taiwan, I found Taiwan is really overdeveloped. Yet, people in Taiwan's period per capita income of $13,000 is only one third of that of the United States. We need to develop. So I keep on asking the question, how an overdeveloped country keep on talking about developing, developing? It doesn't seem to make sense. The developed countries' pattern of growth, which require excessive and often wasteful consumption of natural resources, obviously are not the ideal models for not yet overdeveloped country to emulate. We need to find a new sustainable model for development, paying special attention to harmonizing the relationship between humankind and nature. It is interesting to note that when India became independent, in response to a question of how the people in that country could catch up with the standard of living of the people in Britain, Gandhi right to explain to achieve the standard of living for its population, England had to colonize the entire earth. If India wants to achieve the same standard for its vast population, one has to imagine how many Earths it would require to colonize. Mm -hmm. It is, in a sense, very ironic that the global warming trend, a problem which could become so serious that it may, it may eventually lead to the extinction of humanity, will only cease when fossil fuels upon which modern society is grown to the dependent world, for its ability to drive prosperity and feel, uh, and feel convenience are depleted. However, the likely onset of the energy crisis due to the gap between supply and demand of petroleum will undoubtedly present a formidable challenge for humankind. Global reserve of various types of fossil energy unfortunately remain limited. Experts estimate the crude oil will be pretty depleted in 40 to 60 years. And natural gas in 1800 years. However, production will probably peak much earlier, perhaps within the next 20 to 40 years for both crude oil and natural gas. This means that before we are halfway through this century, it is very likely 
that the gap between the energy demand and supply will have greatly widened and the energy crisis will be here to stay. And if you examine the way Southeast Asia is developing at the present time, including China, India, I think the energy crisis might arrive even sooner. The arrival of the energy crisis will also signal the arrival of a food shortage, as modern agriculture depends greatly on chemical fertilizers, which require a fair amount of energy to synthesize. In fact, 30% of food production is directly attributed to petroleum without access to abundant and inexpensive energy, we will not have enough fertilizer to maintain such high efficiency in food production. <coughs> Additionally, at present, 60% of fibers are also attributed to petroleum. In the foreseeable future, energy crisis and food shortage are most likely to become major causes of conflict in the globalized world. Certainly, we cannot go on as we have been. Things have to change, and we are the ones who must make it happen. We have to face the problem resulting from energy usage and its impact <coughs> on the environment. If we are to achieve sustainable development for the entire world, we must mutually increase energy efficiency, reduce dependence on fossil fuels, develop renewable energies, maintain biodiversity, make a more careful examination of population policies and reduce the consequences of all human activities on our living environment and ecosystem. But perhaps the most important of all, it is time for those who live in, the, in developed countries and consume excessive amounts of natural resources to ask themselves the question, if everyone on Earth were to live like us, could the Earth carry the burden? If not, why should we, developing countries, follow the pattern or follow the footsteps of overdeveloped countries and then turn around in the later time? It doesn't make sense. The other cause of conflict that we need to pay attention to is the fact that although globalization of the world or the world economy is driving us toward a borderless society, it will not reduce the differences among people in various regions overnight. Establishment of new common global policies together with more effective ways of communicating among all the peoples will certainly take time. However, differences among cultural heritages, languages, and religions that make this world so rich and colorful will not and should not be made to disappear. As the world shrinks in relative terms, the onset between peoples becomes more frequent. Whether or not cultural differences will cause an individual crash, as suggested by the well-known scholar Samuel Huntington, who seemed to be entirely dependent on how well people around the world learn to communicate, understand, appreciate, and respect different cultural heritage. <coughs> to become good citizens of the globalized world. We need to learn quickly and also teach, teach our young people 
To see things from a global perspective and respect, appreciate, and understand the difference, different cultures of different peoples. Now, I will move on to discuss a little bit about responsibility of scientists. So, let us move attention to the subject of science in society. A scientist, as a scientist, I often ask myself, if the advancement of sciences really brought substantial benefit to mankind, some might argue that the advancement of science and technology might have brought benefit only about one third of the people on Earth. Developed country seem to have fared better than others. For example, when we glorify the tremendous impact of the Industrial Revolution, which started more than 200 years ago, we must not forget that those countries that fail to catch the wave become colonies of Western powers and suffer immensely as a result. That include most of the Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. In a sense, the recent history of mankind has been marked by strong competition among nations that is still heavily in science and economic development. For result, substantial progress has been made in recent years in international collaboration, the high-tech-based economic competition among nations, which center around information technology, biotech, and nanoscience, is still playing the tune to which the entire world marches. It goes without saying that in this competition, there will be both winners and losers. Countries that lag behind in this wonderful competition will continue to be trapped in the cycle of poverty and misery. I'm sure some of the Asian countries will be able to make it, but some might be very unfortunate might not make it this time around. We should all recognize the fact that the increase in the interconnected world cannot be fully safe if a large percentage of its population still suffers from poverty, chronic disease, illiteracy, unemployment, other barriers to survival. Scientists can play key roles in finding the, the solution to these problems, and this may be part of the reason why we are gathering here today. First of all, scientists to work together to make sure that science should not be used by some to dominate others or to cause damage to our living environment. In 1995, Sir Joseph Rothbard, an Nobel laureate, urged in his acceptance speech that the time has come to formulate guidelines for the ethical conduct of scientists perhaps in the form of a voluntary democratic oath. He argues that scientists should not pursue scientific truths simply for truth's sake without considering the ethical implications of their research. He emphasized 
the social responsibility of scientists and the belief that holding an immoral attitude towards science is actually immoral. A personal responsibility should be tied to the consequences of one's action. Although the idea for a scientific ethic can be traced all the way back to Francis Bacon in the 17th century, practice found on the values and responsibility shared among scientists and engineers have become quite common in recent years. For example, the Peace Prize movement for scientists launched in Japan in 1999 with I, and the sign below, pray with honor and dignity to the best of my knowledge, I will not participate in research, development, manufacture, acquisition, and utilization of nuclear weapons, as well as other weapons of mass destruction. Last year, Dr. Daniel Tsai and Dr. D.S. Chen both associated with the National Taiwan University gave a proposal for young bioscientists admitted to their college for medicine to declare at the moment of my becoming a member of the bioscience community, I need to solemnly declare that I will respect the value and dignity of life and conduct myself to honor this profession. I acknowledge that I have a special responsibility for promoting the welfare of mankind and will so behave as to pursue and exercise my bioscience knowledge in an ethical and socially responsible way. Never will I use my training to do harm to others or the environment. Neither will I do anything to diminish social justice. Whatever action I take and center the uh, career I choose, I will consider the uh, moral implications. Since I realize that only ethical responsible by scientists can hope to contribute to peace and security and thus promote genuine human flourishing, I make this declaration wholeheartedly and upon my honor. This is a very lengthy page, but anyway, it seems to be important. Well, it is certainly very important for the individual scientists to see to it that science brings benefit to mankind. And it should not to be used for evil purposes or to cause unexpected negative consequences. However, if we continue to engage in the fierce, high-tech-based economical competition among nations, it might not be enough for the individual scientists to simply not participate in the research, development, manufacture, acquisition, and utilization of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, or their means of delivery. At the current stage of human development on Earth, there is a difference between the responsibility of the individual scientists and of scientists as a whole. If we do not fully appreciate and understand the rules of the game and the consequences of competition in a globalized market-driven economy, practicing the so-called good sciences for the greater good can still produce miserable losers among us when these good sciences are used as a tool for global economic competition. Just like the industrial revolution of the past, new global competition based on information science and biotechnology are sure to produce losers and these nations will again remain poor and miserable as I mentioned a little earlier. We need to realize that the nation can sustain its prosperity only when 
they are surrounded by prosperous nations. A commitment to mutual prosperity and lifting our neighbors along with ourselves seems to be one of the best strategies in our globalized world. We should always learn to help others. Now, let us examine some of the conflict between sharing scientific knowledge and technology in a globalized world. For centuries, the scientific knowledge accumulated by mankind has been shared quite freely among scientists. Scientists still generally believe firmly that the knowledge accumulated through their efforts should be shared by all. As first advocated by Francis Bacon many years ago, very last century, when Madame Curie was asked why she didn't apply for patents on her discoveries, after all, if she had done so, she would have been as wealthy as Thomas Edison at the time. The reply was quite simple. She did not want to take that advantage because she believed that scientific knowledge should belong to all mankind. In fact, it was her idealistic mindset which first attracted me to science when I was young. In a modern society, however, a scientific knowledge is further developed, transformed into technology and put to use in society, it becomes the basis for economic competition. Protection of pat patents and intellectual property rights has become a very important issue, and the sharing of knowledge now only starts at the basic scientific knowledge and so-called pre-competitive technology. Competitive technology is not really shared. However, the gap or the time lag between scientific discovery and technology in the marketplace has become shorter and shorter. The lag was 100 years for automobiles, 5 years for computers, and only 18 months for microprocessors. Now, in a certain area of scientific investigation, it is no longer possible to distinguish between basic research and associated competitive technology. As the relation between science and technology grows, and grows ever closer, the dilemma of to share or not to share has become an important issue not only for the application of technologies, but also for the basic scientific discoveries themselves. From a globalized viewpoint, it certainly does not seem fair if some countries produce most of the publicly held scientific knowledge while others mainly dedicate themselves to protected, mission-oriented technological development to gain a competitive economic edge. Certainly, in a market-driven economy, free and open economic competition and adequate protection of intellectual property rights are necessary for development. Yet, we must ask seriously whether in a highly globalized world, we can find a new and a better way to allow the creation and sharing of knowledge, while at the same time allowing technology to be carried out in a more orderly fashion to promote sustainable development for the entire world. Strong public global support for the advancement of sciences and the development of technology 
as well as the shortening of the patent protection period might help push change in the election. In recent years, in the field of energy physics and astronomy, scientists have shared their knowledge quite freely and have been more willing to help each other across national boundaries. On the other hand, in the field of biology, scientists tend to protect their intellectual property rights more tightly. In the international meeting of biological sciences, especially related to pharmaceutical research, it is often seen that scientists try to learn as much as possible during the meeting and reveal as little as they can on critical issues that might increase competitiveness. Whether this is due to the fact that high energy physics and astronomy are supported by public funds, while the profit-making pharmaceutical industry dominate many areas of biological research is worth studying in greater detail. Many of the problems we face today are problems that cannot be solved with current scientific knowledge and technology. The way accumulation of new knowledge and the development of new technologies. That is why it is so important to continue our efforts to advance science and technology and develop a new generation of creative science. The 21st century will be the critical turning point for mankind. I'm quite certain that the globalization of world economy will ultimately reduce the risk of military confrontations being used to settle international disputes. If what we face is military confrontation, however, it seems high-tech-based economic competition, then the tensions between advancement of science and the sharing of technology, between economic rationality and the political patients of nation states will not be resolved. And the advancement of science and technology will continue to be used as tool of domination by some rather than for the liberation of all. If, however, we learn to solve problems together, learn, learn to share knowledge, new technological options, and the limited resources available, learn to respect and understand different cultural heritage, then it will be possible to realize the establishment of a genuine global village that promotes sustainable development for all. This is the first time in human history that all human beings on Earth have been faced with learning to work together and live together as one family in a global village. This year, the theme of the epic is called One Community of Future. I totally agree with that concept. This is the first time for finally realizing that planet Earth is finally in space, capacity, natural resources, and the ability to absorb pollution. This is a necessary awakening, vital for the survival and sustainable development of mankind. I believe that if we make the correct choice at this crossroads, then the 21st century is likely to be marked as the great turning point, the great transition toward the dawning of a new era in the history of mankind. In fact, we work to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Proper education of young generation is of utmost importance. 
Indeed, many countries around the world are now engaged in educational reform. Educational systems in many countries, it seems, have not caught up with the changing world. It is quite clear the young people need to do better in mathematics, reading, communication, and science in order to be competitive in the globalized world. But it also seems clear that the education should, in the future, go far beyond the goal of achieving competitiveness. It's, it is important for us to educate all people on Earth to be good citizens of global business, to ensure combination of life skills and global viewpoint, personal tools for product living in this changing world. As the human society continues to develop, we need to continuously change the way we bring up our new generation or the new generation of scholars. At present, many countries around the world are engaged in the educational reform. However, in many Asian countries, partly because of the keen competition among students seeking admission to higher education and partly because of the excessive reliance of written examination, especially written ex entrance examination for the admission. K-12 education is often distorted from the real educational goal. Students seem to spend most of their time getting trained rather than educated. In training, students often carry out repetitious work and learn to solve problems which has been solved before and have clear solutions. On the other hand, we educate our young to become a mature, well-rounded person who can solve many difficult problems which have never been solved before or the programs of the future. In order to do well in the entrance examination of the university, students need to be trained to become skillful technicians who can solve problems in the examination paper efficiently. Unfortunately, the ability to do well in written examination has very little to do with the ability of scientific discovery in the future. In a sense, in the scientific discovery, you have to go into the unknown world. And then you will find something, then you have to tell the teachers, the teachers, you are all wrong. What you told me are all wrong. So by learning all the material accumulated by mankind, might not help you very much in acquiring new knowledge in the future. To be a good scientist or a good scholar, some basic training of course needed, but it is more important to be well educated. I would also like to call your attention to the fact that the nature of the economy is fundamentally changed in the information age, as intelligent machines take over a growing array of routine business functions, the work left for humans is increasing the, the non-programmable tasks, those in which surprise and variability must be accommodated, where only adaptive human intelligence can make the evaluation and decisions needed. In a sense, the common practice in the past for students to learn some skills in a specific field in the university to secure a job to which one could apply one's skills for the entire lifetime is no longer the scenario one should expect. 